Yeah, that's kind of amazing, actually. You know, there are so so many fans. Um, now, th this brings me to another thing that I've been thinking uh, lately. That you know, really smart companies are actually doing now what very small companies were doing 50 years ago, which is really listening to the customers' needs and, and what they want. You know, that that's that was uh, something typical of. Uh, small towns with uh, very few customers, you know, when, when the uh, seller and the producer, they were actually the same person very often, uh, really listened to the feedback. And uh, in during yeah. years, that was that kind of uh, capacity was lost. And now we are refining it in, uh, in companies like Apple, for example, that, that does really cool things with its products, you know, the, yeah. Uh, the latest but, by the way, I don't know. I don't know how much Apple is listening to its customers. I I I think Apple is a, a dictatorial company that think that they know what's best for yeah. their customers. Um, and and you know, I think it's an interesting uh, notion of how much do people know what's good for them. And it, it's a, so so. First of all, let me say two things. One is that a you're right. Many years ago, when companies were small, they had no choice but to listen to their customers. The customers were complaining in their face all right. the time. If you were at the grocery store and people would come and they would complain, right? They would say, hey, I can't find this. Why don't you have that? Then companies became bigger. Uh, they also started making more complex products and listening to the customers became more difficult. You're designing uh, a new phone you know, who are you going to listen to exactly? Where are your customers? Who are they? You don't get the same immediate feedback, right? It's much harder to learn in an environment in which you spend two years producing some, designing something, then producing it, than in that environment in which you have products and you just sort them on the shelf and you can move things up and down. So the, the nature of learning has become much more difficult for companies. Uh, and, and now I think companies are starting to pay more attention and trying to get people more involved in the process. And we have some interesting online tools for people to help companies design the product. There's a very nice guy called Eli Dahan at UCLA who's doing some really nice work on how do you get design tools in the hands of customers before the product is out and basically help the customers design it. And they did it with some cameras and kind of companies got to new insights about what customers really want. The, the other interesting thing though is what are the, what are the limits of that? What are the limits of when people just don't know what they would want? You know, if you asked me to design my next ideal car, I drive, but I'm not an expert. Would I really be able to tell you what's a good car to design for the next 20 years? What would it look like? I might have some vague ideas, but I'm not sure that anybody should really listen to me. Right? Uh, so, so, and I think Apple is one of those companies that is taking um, a dictatorial approach and saying, we understand that people want lots of things, but we also understand their cost and their limitations. And we understand that people want an open architecture, but we also understand the cost of viruses. And we understand that people might want to sell any app that they want, but we also think about uh, young kids and their parents. And because of that, we're going to take all of these constraints and we're going to design a system for you that has much more control. In some sense, it's kind of like a behavior economics perspective, right? Uh, so if, you, if you're a perfect capitalist, you say, let me do just whatever I want and I'll do the right thing, the invisible hand. I'll just do what selfishly is good for me. It will be good for the whole system. And, and behavioral economists say, no, you know, you're more likely to focus on short-term goals. You will not behave well. So we will constrain your ability to make mistakes. And I think Apple is very much like that. Yeah, I've heard um, uh, speak lately. Uh, it was really interesting. They said that they build their new products, implementing things that people want but don't know they want them. Yeah, that's right. So and, yeah, I yeah. think that's the, the other way around. Actually, it's, it's listening to to what customers don't know what actually want. You know. Yeah. So uh, there's another question. Uh, one of our uh, writers has sent us, which is the following. Uh, I think it's really linked to this kind of, uh, of uh, company, especially like Apple. 
um, so this is it. Being perceived as a quality leader in a market means to become a default choice for uh, one series of, uh, of customers. So there's this kind of hysteresis um, that, that you know takes a while to wear off. What do you think about that? Yeah, I think I think that's right. So if you think about people as being cognitively lazy. <clears throat> And if you say that the way we think is basically influenced by what comes to mind first and what we think is the appropriate thing and a normal thing to do and we don't really make extensive decisions, we don't con consider all the possibilities and all the benefits and all the cost, then a, a market leader is a part of the default. That's what we think other people are doing, that we think what's appropriate to do, that's what comes first to mind and because of that it has a big has a big role. I mean, think about something like Facebook uh, <clears throat> and Google Plus, right? Um, you can ask the question of how how quick would people move to Google Plus if they could take all of their links and connections and with a click on a button export it to Google Plus. Right? It will be incredibly, incredibly easy. Uh, to do it as a one as a one step, but when people think about, I want to talk to my friends, I want to check something that is happening. Um, uh, Facebook has this tremendous uh, benefit because it's just there, it's first to mind, it's the most common, most people are using it, so it, it's the default, and it's it's going to be very hard, and it's going to be very interesting to uh, to observe uh, whether Google, with all of its power, can overtake in the long run. I don't mean that they can get users to come and join it as well, because of course they can. The question is, will people actually this be the default social network that they would use? I think at the end of the day, very few people would use two social networks continuously. It just doesn't make sense to uh, waste even more time on two social networks <laughs> rather than one. So <clears throat> the, the question would, can they, can they switch the default when the norm has been established in such a strong way? Um, yeah, you, you actually made something else come to my mind, you know, talking about this cognitive laziness of people, which is being leveraged by uh, many e-commerce players uh, with impulsive buying. Uh-huh. Do you think, uh, how do you think the this kind of laziness of people, you know, uh, the, the fact that you can just buy with one click, you know, uh, influences the fact that you're actually buying or not? because if you have to put in your credit card number and your name and surname and thing, maybe you wouldn't buy it. What do you yep. think the, the influence is? I think, I think it's very large and uh, what we think about as being very small bumps in the road can actually make a big difference. So I'll give an example for this. Uh, there's a company in the US called Express Script. It's a company that sends people f uh, medications. They basically uh, send people medications that they need, cholesterol, heart medication and so on, every few months. And uh, when these medications start, they usually start on branded medication. And then at some point there's a generic medication. And Express Script really wants people to move for the generic medication. It's cheaper for them, it's cheaper for the customer, and it's cheaper for the people who hold the insurance. So what do they do? They write these people and they say, hey, would you switch to generic medications and the people basically don't answer the, the letter and then they send them a colorful brochure and a pre-addressed envelope and do all kinds of things. Now if you think about it, people are going on their own business, they're going on their path, they're not doing any change and Express Script wants them to make a change. They said, hey, take a left here or take a right here, don't continue straight. Um, and for many years they basically said people just don't want generic medication, they just want brand medication. But two or three years ago, they did an experiment. They wrote people and they say, you can no longer do nothing. You continue in your own business, we're stopping you. And you have to return this envelope. And you have to return this letter and you can say you want generic and you can just say you want branded, but you can't do nothing. Now you would think that people could save money on this, on medication, it's quite a lot of money over the year, why wouldn't you spend five minutes of doing it? But the fact is that they don't. But when they have to answer the email, almost 90% switch to generic. 
So what it tells you, I think in a very deep and important way, is that really small bumps in the road, bumps that we don't think matter, actually do end up mattering. That that's our tendency for inaction and to do nothing different is actually very, very powerful. And we need to take it into account when we design different environments and processes. Yeah, I remember your talk at the TED where you illustrated the results for uh, organ donations. That's right. It's the same and, that's, thing. and that's exactly the same principle, yeah. Now, organ donation is a big decision, but it, so it helps on the, the whole scale from big to small. I thought that was really fascinating, actually, because it means that you can, you can not really control, but at least to, some, to a certain amount influence the, the response you're going to get. Yeah. I mean, you know, look, control is not a nice world, word, but the truth is you can control behavior to a very large degree. It's, it's, it sounds manipulative, it sounds, uh, and it is, but this is reality, right? If, if people thought of all the options and took everything into consideration, it will not be in this way, but the fact is that um, people often don't think very extensively. People have other things to think about, and they do whatever is easiest, and the path of this resistance. And because of that, you can really change how people